Hello, my name is Rogan Hamby. This video is going to be part one of a two-part series on testing and signing off on a patch for Evergreen. The background and impetuous for this video is that for years now I have heard people say things like, well, somebody should do a step through of how to do this. So that's what this two-part video series is going to be. This is part one, the useful stuff. If you are already a member of the community, you're familiar with mailing lists and the resources on the wiki and all that kinds of stuff, you're signed up for Launchpad, you can skip this video. Part two will actually step through the mechanics of how to test a patch and sign off on it. This video is for people who are new to the community and want to learn this stuff. This content is oriented towards people who want to test patches. However, a lot of the information is also going to be generally useful. So let's get into it, and then part two will come out in a couple days. And this, all this content will be available on the Evergreen YouTube channel. So the first thing I want to talk about is communication, and I want to take you to our mailing list page. You can see the URL right here. Our mailing lists are very useful. There are a variety of mailing lists for different things, but the one that everybody's going to want to subscribe to is this, the general list, Open ILS General. This is our catch-all. This is where you go to if you're not sure where else to post. Super useful. Other lists that might be particularly of interest to you are some of our technical lists. We have a technical discussion list, Open ILS Dev. A lot of technical discussion goes on there, although some happens on the general list as well. And if you are new to the community and just getting started, I think the EG New Devs list will be of a lot of interest to you. Now, some people come into patch testing just because they want to test patches. Some do it as a stepping stone into development. Both are really legitimate. And there are a lot of tasks that might seem a little odd when you start testing patches, like how do I restart OpenSurf services? If you don't feel comfortable anywhere else asking that, ask that on the new devs list. Uh, I'm sure they'll be thrilled to help. I'm on the list. I'll be glad to answer when I can. The next link I wanted to give you was for our IRC. Now, this is also on our website. If you're not familiar with evergreenils.org, you can go to Get Involved, Communications, and the mailing lists are there as well as IRC. IRC is Internet Relay Chat. For those not familiar with it, it is a text-based communication platform. We do provide on here a number of resources to help you get started. There's a web gateway you can use if you don't have a dedicated client. There's a quick start guide, tutorial on using Chatzilla from Firefox or with Firefox, and all that kind of stuff. We hold a lot of community meetings in IRC. One thing to remember about IRC, though, is it is asynchronous. The main hours that it is populated are working day hours in North America. A lot of our community is in the United States and Canada. We have a healthy community outside North America, but the bulk of active people in IRC are in North America. So if you're looking for a response, you're most likely to find it between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. Eastern to Pacific ranges. I know that's kind of a loose time period, but that's the nature of IRC. However, if you register a nickname and you go in and you ask, ask a question, even if other people aren't active right then, they're likely to respond to it later. So keep that in mind and you can come back and check. Now, the third thing I wanted to show you as a resource is Launchpad. Launchpad is an invaluable resource for people involved in patch testing because this is how you're going to find bugs to test patches for. So let's go from launchpad.net forward slash evergreen to bugs. This is not going to be a full tutorial on using Launchpad. There's a lot more information here that we have time for. But a few things I want to point out is one, the important scale over here that starts with critical, then goes to high, it goes all the way down to wish list. Understand that this is an estimate of how important it is to the project, not a guarantee of when things get addressed. For example, wish list simply means that it doesn't 
pair current functionality. It's an additional feature people want. But sometimes people file that along with the patch to do it because it's a feature they really want. Over here on the tags are, are going to be the most useful thing for people testing patches. And there's a couple of tags I specifically want to point out. One is the byte size tag. Right here there are 49 listed as byte size. We're going to go ahead and open those up. Now byte size tags are going to tend to be small one or two liners. When we do the demonstration video for doing a patch, I'm going to pull from small simple patches. Large complicated patches will require some more advanced Git skills in some cases, depending on how the patches have been posted, with how many follow-ups. But simple pat even a simple patch can contain a number of files and a number of things to restart. These bite-sized ones are generally going to be one or two liners in a single file, which are the perfect way to get started with testing and signing off a patch. These various tags can also be useful in helping you identify areas you feel comfortable in. Perhaps you don't know cataloging, but you're familiar with circulation, so a check-in one might be good for you. Things like that. We're going to go through all the mechanics of actually using Launchpad for a bug in the next video. So after all that, uh, we need to talk just a little bit about the skills you're going to need to actually do this. Now you're going to need to be comfortable with basic Linux server administration and command line because you're going to need to do stuff on a box unless you're splitting it up. Some people do test bugs where someone else sets up the bug environment for them, in which case that person doing that needs these skills. They will need to have a evergreen installation with Postgres and OpenSurf and all that stuff. You will need to know basic git commands because you will need to know how to pull and do a patch. I will actually supply what you will need 90 plus percent of the time in the next video. There's a good chance you will need to know some SQL, specifically Postgres SQL, because a lot of patch testing is going to require modifying data or applying patches unless you have a test server with a copy of really robust production data. However, if you're using the community distributed concerto data, you're, there's a good chance you may have to do things like create older circulations to test a time-related patch. And maybe JavaScript and Perl. I put these down there because while you, strictly speaking, don't need them to test a patch, they can be really useful for providing some feedback sometimes. Now, there's nothing wrong with applying a patch and just saying it doesn't work. In fact, if that's what you feel comfortable with, do that. But if you are comfortable saying, hey, I applied this patch and I know we need a semicolon at the end of a line, and I noticed I'm getting an error and there's none at the end of this line, that's even better feedback to give if you can give it. So having some Perl and JavaScript is nice, but not critical most of the time. You're going to need that Linux test server I mentioned. Generally, I see in our community people running Evergreen on Debian, Ubuntu, and Fedora. You can probably get it running on other Linux distributions with some work. I see people ask about Windows all the time, especially when they send an email to the community OpenILS feedback, or they ask a question on the Facebook page, can I run Evergreen on Windows? And the answer is, in theory, yes. In practice, no. Evergreen is distributed to source code. Much of that source code makes assumptions about the Linux server environment. Could you, with enough work, rewrite it to run on Windows? I'm sure you could. Uh, are you probably going to spend a huge amount of time on what is essentially a quixotic effort? I, probably yes. I, in fact, I would argue that charging at windmills might be more productive because at least you'd get some exercise doing that. But in theory, it's doable. So let's say you want that test server up and you don't have a copy of a production server environment to use. How can you do it? Well, there's a couple of ways. One is Docker. Docker is created, this, these Docker images are distributed by a community member, Blake Henderson, 
and I'm not personally a big Docker user, so I have not used these, but I know they have been used for a number of efforts, including some of our bug squashing days. So these are available if you're a Docker user. For a quick setup, there is also Bill Erickson's Ansible installer. I actually do use this. It's really handy for for automating the tasks of installing on a virtual machine for a testing and development environment. And then finally, you can build it yourself. And I do recommend that at some point, if you start doing a lot of bug testing, that you do this at some point, uh, because it is really handy for understanding how the pieces work together. But I don't think it's critical. Now, if you start doing development, I think the importance of doing that at some point goes up. Right now, our current stable release is 3.5 series. We have release notes, change log, and down here, install instructions. So that will step you through on how to do it. And there are two ways you can do this. You can download a tarball, which is a tar and gzipped group of files to install from, or install from Git. I recommend using the Git because it will make your life a little bit easier in the testing and install. And in fact, in the next video where we step through how to test and install a patch, I'm going to do basic Git downloading steps and all that so that you kind of have it as a cheat sheet. And I spoke about the Ansible installs and doing a manual install. Now we want to talk about the Git keys just a little bit. For a patch, there are two different ways to sign off on a patch. One is you can go back to the launch pad and you can actually respond in launch pad, I sign off on this patch with and supply your name and email. A nicer way to do it that automates things for people doing the backend patch management is to push a commit. And I'm going to actually step through and show you how to do that in the next video, but you will want some keys set up first which is why I'm covering that part in this video, so that you have time to do that before the next if you want to. This page, wiki.evergreen-ils.org forward slash docu.php question mark id equals dev colon git. This will step you through everything you need to do on a Linux box to set up your keys, including emailing git admin to have them installed on the working repo. And I'll next video talk about the difference between the main and working repos and that kind of thing. And that is the fundamentals of what you'll need. I do want to point out that the wiki is also a great place to find some other useful information, including some cheat sheets on how to restart services and stuff like that. So there you go. And I already talked a little bit about this, but in addition to the basic Linux system skills, you'll want some familiarity with Evergreen itself. Because, of course, if you're going to go test a patch about cataloging, you'll probably want to understand how you catalog in Evergreen and do mark records and all that kind of stuff. So, there we go. This was just a quick video to put you in touch with some resources. And I'm going to go ahead and post this on YouTube today, probably. And then in a few days, I'm going to step you through actually doing all this stuff. Okay, so have a good day and Evergreen on.